Welcome back to Storytime Haven, adventurers. Today, we're diving back into the magical world of Belle and the Beast. Remember that brave girl who befriended a grumpy creature and broke a terrible curse? Well, their journey isn't over yet. There are still whispers of darkness lingering, and the ever-resourceful Belle is determined to uncover the truth. The sun dripped golden honey over the village, painting the cobbled streets a warm yellow. Birds chirped sweet melodies as children chased each other, their laughter echoing off the old stone buildings. But tucked away in a quiet corner, beneath the shade of a giant mulberry tree, sat Belle, a girl quite unlike the others. Belle wasn't interested in skipping rope or gossiping with the baker's daughter. Her nose was always buried deep in a book, her brow furrowed in concentration. With each turn of the page, she'd be whisked away to fantastical lands, sailing the high seas on pirate ships or attending grand balls in shimmering castles. The mulberry tree was Belle's haven. Its thick, leafy canopy formed a secret world, sunlight dappling through the leaves in a mesmerizing pattern. Here, surrounded by the comforting scent of ripe mulberries, Belle could be a brave knight rescuing a damsel in distress or a cunning detective solving a baffling mystery. One day, as Belle devoured a book about a daring explorer lost in the Amazon jungle, a loud, booming voice startled her. It was her father, Maurice, a kind and gentle inventor with a twinkle in his eye. Belle, time to come inside. Dinner's ready, and I have a tale to tell about the most peculiar invention I saw at the market today. Belle reluctantly closed her book, its worn leather cover whispering secrets back to her. She sighed, knowing her adventures would have to wait. With a smile for her father, she skipped out from under the mulberry tree, its leaves rustling like whispered goodbyes. Inside their cozy cottage, the aroma of freshly baked bread filled the air. Belle's five older sisters, all bustling with energy, bickered playfully over who would get the biggest slice. Maurice, his face smeared with grease from tinkering all day, grinned at his beloved daughter. There you are, my little bookworm. Now, wouldn't you believe it? He began excitedly, launching into a story about a self-stirring soup pot he'd seen at the market. Belle listened patiently, her love for her father warming her heart even more than the hot soup. Though their life wasn't filled with riches, Belle felt richer than any princess in her books. With a loving family, a cozy cottage, and a world waiting to be explored within the pages of her beloved stories, Belle knew she had everything she truly needed. The crisp autumn air swirled with fallen leaves as Maurice set out for the market in the neighboring town. He planned to sell a few of his latest inventions, hoping to earn enough to buy Belle a new book, the one she'd been eyeing at the village bookstore for weeks. The journey was long, and by nightfall, a thick fog rolled in, obscuring the path. Lost and shivering, Maurice stumbled upon a clearing in the woods. There, bathed in an eerie moonlight, stood a magnificent yet undeniably unsettling castle. Tall, dark spires pierced the night sky, and arched windows glowed with a dim, flickering light. Gargoyles, with eyes that seemed to follow him, crouched on the castle walls. And shiver ran down Maurice's spine, but seeing no other option, he cautiously approached the castle gates. The massive doors creaked open with a deafening groan, sending another wave of chills down Maurice's back. Hesitantly, he stepped inside, the silence broken only by the echo of his own footsteps. The air hung heavy with dust and an inexplicable sadness. Wandering through the echoing halls, Maurice stumbled upon a magnificent rose garden. In its center, bathed in a sliver of moonlight, bloomed a single, perfect red rose. Mesmerized by its beauty, Maurice reached out and plucked it, a small act that would change his life forever. As he turned to leave the garden, a deafening roar filled the air. The ground trembled, and out of the shadows emerged a terrifying beast. Its fur was matted, its eyes glowed with anger, and its roar seemed to shake the very foundations of the castle. Terror gripped Maurice's heart. Who dares trespass in my domain? Boomed a voice like thunder. The beast, its gaze fixed on the rose in Maurice's trembling hand, let out another deafening roar. Forgive me, creature, stammered Maurice his voice small in the vast hall. I was lost and found myself drawn to the beauty of your rose. I meant no offense, but the beast was enraged. Such a petty excuse for a theft, he bellowed. You will pay dearly for your arrogance. His anger seemed to fill the room. 
suffocating Maurice with its intensity. With a wave of his massive paw, the beast grabbed Maurice and threw him into a dark dungeon. As the heavy iron door slammed shut, plunging Maurice into darkness, one thought filled his mind. What would become of Belle? Days bled into nights for Maurice, trapped in the cold, damp dungeon of the beast's castle. Fear gnawed at his heart, worry for Belle a constant ache in his chest. He had no idea what the beast intended for him, and the silence was a heavy weight. One morning, a sliver of sunlight pierced the darkness, illuminating a rickety wooden tray laden with a simple bowl of stew and a crust of bread. As Maurice devoured the meager meal, a creak echoed through the dungeon, and the heavy door swung open. In the dim light, Maurice saw a hunched figure cloaked in darkness. It was Lumiere, the talking candelabra, his once lively flame flickering faintly. Behind him, followed by a nervous-looking teapot named Mrs. Potts, and a young, chipped cup named Chip, stood the fearsome beast. Maurice, the beast rumbled, his voice surprisingly deep and gravelly. I have considered your punishment. He paced the small dungeon, his massive form barely contained within the stone walls. Maurice, his voice raw from disuse, stammered, Please, sir, I meant no harm. <sighs> Pay for the rose. Anything. The beast stopped, his gaze locking onto Maurice. There is no price for a stolen rose, he growled. But he paused, his voice softer now. I see fear in your eyes, but also love for your daughter. A spark of hope flickered within Maurice. Bell, he whispered, his voice thick with emotion. She'll be worried sick. Then perhaps, the beast continued, his voice laced with a hint of sadness. Who can offer a trade? Your freedom, for hers. Maurice's heart pounded like a drum. My daughter, why would you want? Before Maurice could finish his question, the beast cut him off. She entered my thoughts after seeing your love for her. Perhaps she could bring some light back into this cursed place. The offer was terrifying, but the thought of leaving Belle to face this monstrous creature alone was unbearable. Very well, Maurice said, his voice trembling slightly. I accept your bargain. A flicker of surprise crossed the beast's face. Be warned, he said, his voice gruff but strangely hesitant. This castle holds secrets best left hidden. But your daughter, if she chooses to come, must be willing to stay of her own free will. With a wave of his paw, the beast summoned a magical mirror. Its surface rippled, showing Belle in their cozy cottage, a worried frown etched on her face. Tears welled up in Maurice's eyes. Belle, he croaked, his voice barely a whisper. Lumiere, his flame flickering with renewed light, guided Maurice out of the dungeon. As they ascended the grand staircase, the echoing silence of the castle pressed around them. The weight of the bargain hung heavy in the air. Finally, they reached Belle's reflection in the mirror. Bell, Maurice cried, desperation lacing his voice. It's me, Papa. I'm trapped here. He managed to recount his ordeal, his voice choked with emotion. As Belle listened, her face grew pale. Seeing the fear in her father's eyes, she knew she had to do something. This monstrous beast was holding her father captive, and only she could save him. Taking a deep breath, she looked directly at her reflection. Papa, she said, her voice firm despite her trembling heart, I'm coming to get you. The journey to the beast's castle was long and arduous. Belle rode on horseback, wrapped in a thick cloak against the biting winter wind. Her heart pounded in her chest, a drumbeat of fear and determination. Images of the beast as described by her frightened father, filled her mind, a terrifying creature shrouded in darkness, filled with rage. As dusk settled, casting long shadows across the land, Belle finally emerged from the dense forest. The imposing silhouette of the castle rose before her, its spires piercing the twilight sky. A sense of foreboding washed over her, but she pushed forward, the thought of her father fueling her courage. Reaching the massive iron gates, Belle dismounted, she hesitated for a moment, the silence broken only by the howling wind. Then, with a deep breath, she knocked on the heavy oak door. The silence stretched on, each passing moment amplifying Belle's anxiety. Finally, with a groaning creak, the door swung open a sliver, revealing only darkness. 
A voice, deep and gravelly, boomed across the courtyard. Who dares disturb the peace of this castle? Belle swallowed hard. It's me, Belle, she called out, her voice surprisingly steady. I've come to take my father's place, as we agreed. After a tense pause, the door swung open wider, revealing a dimly lit corridor. Alone, flickering candle cast grotesque shadows on the stone walls. Belle stepped inside, her heart racing. Lumiere, the candelabra whose flame now burned brightly, emerged from the shadows. Welcome, Miss Belle, he said, his voice slightly wavering. The beast awaits you. With trepidation, Belle followed Lumiere down the echoing hall. The castle was grand, its high ceilings adorned with intricate carvings and faded tapestries. But dust lay thick on furniture, and an air of melancholy hung heavy in the air. Reaching a set of massive double doors, Lumiere bowed. With you, Miss Belle, he said, his flame flickering ever so slightly. With a deep breath, Belle pushed open the doors and stepped into a grand hall. There, at the far end of the room, bathed in the faint light of a roaring fire, sat the beast. He was even bigger than Belle had imagined, covered in thick fur, his eyes glowing embers in the shadows. It was a terrifying sight, yet there was a sense of sadness in his demeanor that tugged at Belle's heart. The silence stretched on, filled only by the crackling fire. Belle, despite her fear, forced a smile. You must be the beast, she said, her voice surprisingly calm. I'm Belle. The beast stared at her for a long moment, his expression unreadable. Then, in a voice like thunder, he bellowed, So, the replacement has arrived. Do you understand the terms of this arrangement, girl? Belle stood her ground, her chin held high. Yes, beast, she replied. I do. Despite the danger, a spark of curiosity flickered within her. This wasn't just a monstrous beast. There was something else something hidden beneath the rage and fear. With a gesture of his paw, the beast indicated a nearby chair. Then sit, he rumbled. We have much to discuss. Nervously, Belle walked towards the chair, her eyes flitting across the room. In the flickering firelight, she noticed other figures watching from the shadows. A teapot, a clock, and a young chipped cup stood huddled together, their expressions a mix of apprehension and curiosity. Clearing her throat, Belle reached out a hand. Perhaps, she said, her voice wavering slightly. We could start with introductions. After all, we'll be living together for a while. A flicker of surprise crossed the beast's face. Was this girl actually trying to make conversation? Then, from the side, a voice squeaked. Yeah, please. Introductions would be lovely. It was Chip, the chipped cup, his voice bright and cheerful. A small smile tugged at the corner of Belle's lips. This wouldn't be an easy journey, but perhaps, just perhaps, there was a flicker of hope within the darkness of the beast's castle. The air in the Grand Hall remained thick with tension despite Belle's attempt at pleasantries. The beast, his attention mostly focused on the crackling fire, grunted a curt acknowledgement before returning to his brooding silence. Belle, perched on the edge of a plush armchair that seemed built for someone much larger, felt the weight of a thousand eyes upon her. Glancing towards the shadows, she saw the talking teapot, Mrs. Potts, nervously polishing a silver spoon. Beside her, Cogsworth, the fussy clock, ticked loudly, his gears whirring in what seemed like perpetual agitation. Lumiere, however, hovered closer, his flame casting a warm glow on Belle's face. Ah, Miss Belle, he whispered, his voice flickering slightly. They're just nervous. They haven't had a guest in years. Belle offered him a small smile. I understand, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. It's rather intimidating. With a loud clang, a large silver platter materialized on the table before them. Belle flinched, startled by the sudden appearance. Lumiere chuckled, a soft, tinkling sound. Fret not, Miss Belle, he said. That would be our chef, Zip. He might look a bit intimidating, but his heart is as warm as his roast beast, as if on cue, a large, muscular-looking stove with a grumpy face materialized beside the platter. A plume of smoke billowed from his chimney as he grumbled, Honestly, 
Who needs introductions when the food speaks for itself? Ignoring Zip's grumbling, Lumiere guided Belle towards the table. As she sat down, she noticed a single rose, identical to the one her father had plucked, placed beside her plate. A small pang of guilt stabbed at her heart. This was the reason she was here, the reason for the beast's anger and the castle's strange state. The beast, finally breaking his silence, roared, Eat, girl, don't expect me to entertain you with conversation. Belle, startled by his outburst, took a small bite of the roast beast. It was surprisingly delicious, the meat tender and bursting with flavor. Despite herself, she found herself complimenting Zip's cooking. A flicker of surprise crossed Zip's face, quickly replaced by a gruff nod. Not bad, huh? Though you could use a bit more meat on those bones. Belle chuckled, finding his gruffness oddly endearing. As they ate, she noticed the enchanted objects watching her intently. Mrs. Potts, her spout trembling slightly, cleared her throat. So, Miss Belle, she began, her voice warm and motherly. Tell us about your village. It's been ages since we've heard anything of the outside world. Emboldened by Mrs. Potts' kindness, Belle began to tell them about life in her village. She spoke of the bustling marketplace, the baker's delicious pastries, and the gossip that swirled around the village well. As she spoke, a strange thing happened. The castle, which had seemed so cold and desolate upon her arrival, began to come alive. Cogsworth's ticking, once a source of nervous tension, became a comforting rhythm in the background. Mrs. Potts, while still worried about Belle's safety, hummed a gentle tune under her breath. Even the beast, though still aloof, seemed less menacing. With every detail Belle shared about her life, a flicker of longing seemed to flicker in his eyes. It was as if, through her stories, a forgotten world was being brought back to life within the castle walls. By the time the last crumbs were devoured, the initial tension had melted away, replaced by a sense of cautious camaraderie. Belle, for all her anxieties, felt a strange sense of hope. Perhaps, just perhaps, there was more to this castle and the beast within it than she had ever imagined. The days that followed Belle's arrival settled into a peculiar routine. Her mornings were spent exploring the vast and dusty castle, accompanied by the ever-cheerful Lumiere. In the afternoons, Belle would take her meals with the beast, the silence punctuated only by the clatter of silverware and the occasional gruff comment from Zip. Despite the tension, Belle found herself drawn to the library, a magnificent room overlooking the castle gardens. Towering bookshelves lined the walls, filled with countless leather-bound volumes. It was a treasure trove of stories waiting to be discovered. One afternoon, finding the beast brooding by the window, Belle gathered her courage and stepped forward. Beast, she began, her voice tentative. Would you perhaps be interested in hearing a story? The beast turned, his eyes narrowed. A story? What good is a story to someone in my condition? Belle held his gaze steadily. Stories can take us to new places, introduce us to fascinating people, and offer a glimpse of hope, she said. Even within the walls of this castle. Intrigued despite himself, the beast grunted in agreement. Belle, delighted, chose a book with a worn leather cover and colorful illustrations. This one, she announced, settling into a comfortable armchair, is about a brave knight who embarks on a quest to... Her voice filled the room, weaving a tale of adventure, courage, and self-discovery. The beast, initially resistant, found himself drawn into the story. As Belle described daring escapes and perilous battles, the beast's posture relaxed, and a flicker of longing appeared in his eyes. Perhaps, he thought, such a life wasn't entirely out of reach even for a creature like him. When the story ended, the room was filled with a comfortable silence. Belle glanced at the beast, Surprised to see a glimmer of curiosity replacing his usual scowl. There are more like this, I presume? He rumbled, his voice surprisingly gentle. Belle nodded, her heart swelling with a newfound sense of connection. They spent the rest of the afternoon lost in stories, sharing tales of faraway lands, mythical creatures, and brave heroes. As twilight settled, casting long shadows across the library, Belle stumbled upon a peculiarity, a loose brick nestled between two bookshelves felt strangely hollow. Pushing against it, she was surprised to find it shifted, 
revealing a narrow passage hidden behind the wall. Curiosity sparked. Belle turned to the beast. What's this? she asked, pointing towards the hidden passage. The beast's face hardened. A secret passage, he growled. One that leads somewhere you shouldn't go. Despite his warning, Belle felt a thrill of adventure bubbling within her. What secrets did this passage hold? Why was the beast so determined to keep it hidden? But before she could ask any further questions, Mrs. Potts bustled into the library, her teacup clinking in alarm. Belle, we've been looking everywhere for you. Dinner is ready. With a heavy heart, Belle knew she had to postpone exploring the secret passage. A new mystery had been ignited, and a seed of determination blossomed within her. She would unravel the secrets of this castle, one step at a time. The forbidden passage gnawed at Belle's curiosity. Every spare moment, her mind drifted back to the hidden entrance behind the towering bookshelves. The beast's stern warning only fueled her desire to explore. One evening, after a tense dinner where the beast barely spoke a word, Belle excused herself, pretending to retire to her room. However, with a mischievous glint in her eye and Lumiere's wink of approval, given in secret, of course, she made her way back to the library. The hidden passage beckoned, a dark gap in the otherwise pristine bookcase. Taking a deep breath, Belle wedged herself through the narrow opening. Dust motes danced in the faint light from her hidden lantern, illuminating a narrow, stone corridor that descended downwards. The air grew colder, damp, and stale. The only sound was the echo of Belle's own heartbeat and the drip-drip of water somewhere in the distance. A shiver ran down her spine, but the urge to explore was stronger than her fear. After what felt like an eternity, the passage opened into a vast, cavernous chamber. Belle gasped in awe. The room was filled with magnificent tapestries, faded but still retaining fragments of vibrant colors. Gilded furniture stood gathering dust, shrouded in cobwebs like forgotten memories. In the center of the room stood a large, ornately framed mirror, its surface dull and opaque. As Belle approached, a gentle breeze swept through the chamber, brushing against the mirror's surface. It shimmered for a moment, then cleared to reveal a swirling vortex of colors. Intrigued, Belle stepped closer. Images flickered within the vortex, a bustling marketplace, children playing in a sunny meadow, a young woman with familiar brown hair and twinkling eyes. Belle herself. Suddenly, a booming voice echoed through the chamber, shattering the fragile silence. Belle! roared the beast. What are you doing here? Belle spun around, startled, to see the beast standing at the entrance to the chamber, his face contorted in anger. Shame filled her heart. She had disobeyed him, venturing into a place he'd specifically forbidden. I... I just wanted to see. She stammered, her voice barely a whisper. Ignoring her explanation, the beast strode towards her. He towered over her, his eyes blazing with fury. Didn't I warn you? This passage leads to forbidden things, things that have no place in your world. His anger was terrifying, but Belle stood her ground. Tears welled up in her eyes. You warned me of a passage, she said, her voice surprisingly steady. But did you warn me of a prison? This entire castle is a prison, for you as much as for me. The beast recoiled as if struck. His rage seemed to flicker, replaced by a flicker of pain in his eyes. He turned away from her, his voice hoarse. You don't understand, he growled. The chamber echoed with a heavy silence. Shame and anger warred within Belle. She had broken the beast's trust, and in doing so, unearthed a raw vulnerability beneath his gruff exterior. Knowing she had pushed things too far, Belle hung her head in defeat. I'm sorry, she mumbled. I shouldn't have disobeyed you. The beast remained silent, his back turned towards her. The cavernous chamber suddenly felt suffocatingly small. Belle knew it was time to leave. With a heavy heart, she turned and retraced her steps back up the passage, the image of the beast's pain lingering in her mind. Emerging from the hidden entrance, Belle found Lumiere waiting anxiously. His flame flickered with worry. Miss Belle? Where have you been? The beast was frantic. Belle could only shake her head, tears welling up again. I... I shouldn't have gone down there, she choked out. I broke his trust. Lumiere patted her shoulder, his voice a comforting rasp. 
We all make mistakes, Miss Bell, but what matters is how we mend them. Bell looked back at the hidden passage, a silent promise forming in her heart. She would find a way to understand the beast's pain and the secrets it held within this dusty, forgotten chamber. It was the least she could do after breaking his trust. The following days were shrouded in a heavy silence. Bell, consumed by guilt and regret over venturing into the forbidden chamber, avoided the beast whenever possible. He, in turn, seemed to retreat further into his brooding solitude. The once lively atmosphere of shared stories and cautious camaraderie had vanished. One rainy afternoon, trapped indoors, Belle found herself wandering aimlessly through the echoing halls. The castle, once fascinating in its grandeur, now felt cold and isolating. A longing for the warmth and laughter of her village filled her heart. Suddenly, a mischievous idea sparked in her mind. Perhaps, she thought, a little distraction was exactly what everyone needed. Stepping into the Grand Hall, she found Lumiere dusting a suit of armor with a downcast expression. Lumiere, she began hesitantly, do you ever miss, well, being human? Lumiere paused in his dusting, a flicker of longing crossing his features. Miss Bell, he sighed, all of us, Cogsworth, Mrs. Potts, Chip. We all miss the feeling of sunlight on our skin, the taste of a warm meal, a smile tugged at the corner of Belle's lips. Well, then, she declared with newfound determination, let's have a little fun. Oh, about a game of... Make-believe. Lumiere, his curiosity peaked, tilted his head. Make-believe? But how? Belle, drawing inspiration from a childhood game, explained the concept. We'll pretend for a while, she elaborated, to be human again. You can be a butler. Mrs. Potts can bake us some delicious treats, and she glanced nervously towards the beast's chambers. Who knows? Maybe even the beast will join us. Lumiere's flame flickered hesitantly. It seemed an outrageous proposition, yet the prospect of feeling human again, even for a moment, was undeniably tempting. A mischievous glint appeared in his eyes. Very well, Miss Bell, he said, a playful rasp to his voice. Let the games begin. With a newfound sense of purpose, Belle scurried around, assigning roles and gathering whatever props they could find. Within minutes, the Grand Hall was transformed. Mrs. Potts, her teapot gleaming with renewed vigor, donned a makeshift apron. Chip, with a strategically placed piece of fabric tied around his handle, declared himself the official gamekeeper. Even Cogsworth, initially resistant to such frivolity, found himself swept up in the playful spirit. He donned an old hat and declared himself the headmaster of a prestigious boarding school, a role Bell quickly reminded him was entirely unsuitable for a clock. The highlight of the evening, however, was yet to come. With a nervous flutter in her stomach, Bell approached the beast's chambers. Heaving a deep breath, she knocked on the heavy oak door. The response came in a deep rumble. What is it? Beast, Bell pleaded. We're having a... Game downstairs. A bit of a distraction from the rain, you know. Would you like to join us? A tense silence followed, then a low growl escaped the room. Oh, game. The beast muttered, but then, to Belle's surprise, the door creaked open a sliver, revealing a hesitant figure. The beast, stripped of his usual imposing demeanor, looked strangely vulnerable. He glanced at the makeshift game unfolding before him, his eyes flickering between the excited chatter and the playful decorations. For a moment, Bell thought he might retreat again, but then, with a gruff mumble, he stepped out of his chambers. The game, once filled with nervous energy, transformed into something more. As they played, the laughter that filled the hall wasn't mocking or forced. It was genuine, a shared moment of forgetfulness and joy. For a stolen evening, the castle felt less like a prison and more like a strange, unexpected home. Underneath the layers of anger and fear, Belle glimpsed a man, or perhaps the ghost of a man, yearning for connection. And for the first time, she felt a flicker of something else, a spark of empathy for the lonely beast trapped within the castle walls. The warmth of the make-believe game lingered in the air, even after the rain had stopped. Belle, emboldened by the shared laughter, found herself drawn back to the library. 
As she browsed the towering bookshelves, her fingers brushed against a familiar worn leather cover. It was the book she'd chosen to read for the beast, the one with the captivating stories of brave knights and perilous quests. A pang of guilt stabbed at her heart. They hadn't finished the book before their connection soured after her discovery of the Forbidden Chamber. Lost in thought, Belle almost missed the small, ornately framed portrait tucked behind a stack of leather-bound histories. It depicted a handsome young man with kind eyes and a gentle smile. A gasp escaped her lips. The resemblance to the beast was undeniable, although the man in the portrait seemed filled with joy, a stark contrast to the creature she knew. Curiosity gnawed at her. Who was this man, and how was he connected to the beast? Picking up the portrait, she turned it over, hoping to find a clue. On the back was a faded inscription. To my dearest Maurice, with love always, your Belle. The inscription sent a jolt through Belle. Maurice, her own father, could this be a portrait of the beast before the curse? But how, and what kind of love could exist between a handsome prince and a simple inventor's daughter? A wave of conflicting emotions washed over her. Confusion, anger, and a strange sense of hope battled within her chest. This portrait was a missing piece, a clue to the beast's past and the curse that had imprisoned him. Suddenly, a heavy voice echoed through the library. Belle, what are you doing? It was the beast, his eyes narrowed in suspicion. Startled, Belle fumbled with the portrait, nearly dropping it. The beast stalked towards her, his fur bristling. Is that? He growled, his voice strained. Before Belle could answer, Cogsworth, his gears whirring with agitation, rushed into the library. Beast, there you are. We need to talk. The urgency in Cogsworth's voice shifted the beast's attention. What is it, Cogsworth? He rumbled, his gaze still lingering on the portrait in Belle's hand. It's the rose, Cogsworth stammered. Its petals are withering. They won't last much longer. A flicker of horror crossed the beast's face. The rose, the symbol of the curse. If it wilted and died, the curse would solidify, trapping him as a beast forever. Without a word, the beast turned and stormed out of the library. Belle, her mind reeling with questions, followed close behind. Beast, wait, she cried. This portrait, it's you, isn't it? What happened? How did you become this? Stopped. His back turned to her. His voice was a low growl, filled with pain and regret. That's a story for another time, he rasped. Right now, there's more important things to worry about. He continued down the hallway, leaving Belle holding the portrait, the weight of its implications pressing down on her. This was more than just a stolen rose and a broken promise. The beast's curse was connected to her father, and she was determined to uncover the truth. Armed with a newfound determination, Belle knew she had to find a way to save the rose. Not just for the beast, but to unravel the curse that held both her father and the creature within its grasp. Perhaps, just perhaps, there was still hope within the crumbling walls of the beast's castle. The castle buzzed with frantic activity. Lumiere, his flame flickering urgently, directed Mrs. Potts and Chip in a desperate attempt to revitalize the withering rose. Belle, her heart pounding in her chest, stood beside the beast, the portrait clutched tightly in her hand. The rose, once a symbol of defiance, now hung limp and discolored. Its petals, once vibrant red, were turning brown and brittle. Every tick of Cogsworth, once a source of annoyance, now felt like a hammer blow against Belle's hope. The beast paced the room, a caged animal trapped by his own curse. Anger simmered in his eyes, but beneath it, a raw vulnerability shone through. Belle understood his fear. Time was running out. Must be a way, she whispered, her voice barely audible above the frantic activity. There has to be something in this castle that can help. As if in response to her plea, a flicker of recognition crossed Mrs. Potts' face. Her spout trembled slightly. Miss Belle, she said, her voice a comforting hum. There might be something, but it's forbidden. Intrigued and desperate, Belle stepped closer. Forbidden? What do you mean? Mrs. Potts glanced nervously at the beast, who remained lost in his own turmoil. There's a hidden room, she explained in a hushed tone. 
deep within the West Wing. It contains, well, magical artifacts. But the beast forbade anyone from entering after. She trailed off, her voice thick with emotion. After what? Bell pressed, a sense of urgency building within her. After the curse, Mrs. Potts finished in a whisper. He said it held nothing but dark magic and painful memories. Bell looked at the beast, then back at the withering rose. The risk was undeniable, but so was the need. We have no choice, she declared, her voice stronger than she felt. We need to find what we're looking for. With a heavy heart and a flicker of rebellion, Bell led the way. Mrs. Potts, her teapot clinking nervously, followed close behind. Together, they navigated the labyrinthine corridors of the West Wing, guided by Mrs. Potts' faded memories. The room itself was dusty and filled with cobwebs. Moonlight, filtering through a cracked window, cast long, eerie shadows on the shelves overflowing with books, strange potions, and arcane-looking instruments. It felt like a forgotten graveyard of magic. Spotting a large, leather-bound book adorned with cryptic symbols, Belle reached for it. As she brushed away the dust, a faint inscription shimmered into view on the cover. The Book of Forgotten Spells, with trembling hands. She opened the book, its pages filled with spidery handwriting and complex diagrams. It was filled with spells, some promising, others dark and foreboding, but her heart quickened as she spotted a section titled Breaking Curses. Hours melted away as Belle scanned the pages. The language was difficult to decipher, but with Mrs. Potts' help and a smattering of forgotten spells she'd gleaned from her village library, Belle started to piece together a plan. The ritual, however, was complex and required rare ingredients. Some, Belle recognized, moonlight essence, a single tear of sorrow. Others, however, were obscure, a feather from a phoenix, a drop of a mythical creature's blood. Disappointment washed over her. How could they possibly find such things in the short time they had left? But then, an idea sparked in her mind. It was a long shot, but it was their only hope. Emerging from the forbidden room, Belle found the beast pacing outside, his face etched with despair. She held up the book, a flicker of determination in her eyes. There might be a way, she said, her voice shaking slightly, but we need your help. The revelation that the Book of Forgotten Spells offered a sliver of hope sent a jolt of energy through the castle. Despair had threatened to engulf them, but Belle's discovery rekindled a flickering flame of defiance. As Belle presented the ancient tome to the beast, a mixture of skepticism and curiosity clouded his features. He skimmed the pages, his brow furrowed in concentration. Breaking curses, he rumbled, his voice hoarse. Are you certain this isn't just another fool's errand? There's no guarantee, Belle admitted, her gaze steady. But it's our only chance. The ritual requires specific ingredients, some of which she trailed off, her voice betraying the rising anxiety in her chest. Are impossible to find, the beast finished, his shoulders slumping in defeat. Of course, just another cruel twist of fate. Despite his pessimism, Belle saw a flicker of something else in his eyes a desperate longing for escape. Taking a deep breath, she laid out her plan. The book mentions substitutes, she explained. For some of the rare ingredients, it suggests alternatives with a personal connection to the one cursed. The beast's ears perked up. Personal connection? What do you mean? The feather of a phoenix, Belle continued, could be replaced with a symbol of rebirth, perhaps a shed fragment of your former self. A thoughtful silence descended upon the room. The beast paced, his claws clicking nervously against the stone floor. The weight of the decision hung heavy in the air. And the tear of sorrow, Bell added softly, could be replaced with a tear shed for a love lost, a life forever changed. Her words resonated deeply with the beast. He glanced at the withering rose, its fragility a stark reminder of his curse. Then, his gaze met Bell's his eyes filled with a vulnerability he had tried so hard to mask. You are asking for a great deal, he rumbled, his voice surprisingly gentle. To relive a painful past, to bleed for a creature so monstrous, Belle squared her shoulders, meeting his gaze with unwavering resolve. 
You are not a monster, she said, her voice firm but filled with empathy. You are a man trapped in a curse. And this, perhaps, is our chance to break free, both of us. For a long moment, the chamber hung in tense silence. The ticking of Cogsworth, once a source of annoyance, now felt like a drumbeat echoing the anxiety in their hearts. Finally, the beast spoke, his voice hoarse with resignation. Very well, he said, a hint of desperation lacing his tone. Let us see if these forgotten spells hold any truth. But be warned, Bell, this ritual may come at a greater cost than we imagine. With a heavy heart, the beast reached out a massive paw, his claws carefully plucking a single strand of fur, once pristine white but now darkened with the curse. He gently placed it in Bell's outstretched hand. Then, his movements jerky and awkward, the beast lifted a single, heavy claw to his eye. A single tear, shimmering like a pearl, rolled down his cheek. Bell, her own eyes stinging with unshed tears, held out a small vial from her bag. With trembling fingers, the beast caught the tear as it fell, allowing it to drip into the vial. The room seemed to hold its breath as the glistening tear dissolved, leaving behind a faint luminescence. With the two crucial ingredients acquired, Bell consulted the Book of Forgotten Spells once more. The remaining substitutes were more familiar, moonlight essence collected after midnight under a full moon and a handful of crushed moonflowers growing in a hidden corner of the greenhouse. As midnight approached, casting the castle in an ethereal blue glow, Bell stood in the heart of the Grand Hall, surrounded by the concerned faces of Lumiere, Mrs. Potts, Chip, and Cogsworth. The beast stood opposite her, his form imposing yet vulnerable. Belle held the vial containing the tear of sorrow and the strand of fur, her heart pounding in her chest. The ritual instructions were clear, though cryptic. She began to chant, her voice filling the cavernous hall, the words echoing off the stone walls. As she chanted, a pale light emanated from the vial in her hand, swirling around them both. The air crackled with a mysterious energy, sending shivers down everyone's spine. The beast's form seemed to waver momentarily, then solidified. Suddenly, a blinding flash of light filled the room. Belle squeezed her eyes shut, bracing for the impact. When she opened them again, a gasp escaped her lips. The beast was gone. In his place stood a man, tall and handsome, with a kind face and eyes that mirrored the amber glow of the fire crackling in the hearth. Relief washed over Belle, a wave so powerful it threatened to drown her. But a flicker of concern remained. The man, though undoubtedly human, looked older, his face etched with lines that spoke of a life lived under a heavy burden. Beast? She whispered, her voice barely a breath. The man turned towards her, a flicker of recognition flickering in his eyes. Bell? He rumbled, his voice deeper than she remembered, but strangely familiar. <sighs> Truly you. The blinding light faded, revealing a figure standing triumphantly in the center of the grand hall. It was a man, tall and broad-shouldered, with a kind face framed by dark hair streaked with silver. His eyes, the color of deep amber, held a mixture of confusion and relief as they met Belle's gaze. A choked gasp escaped her lips. The resemblance to the portrait was uncanny, yet there were subtle differences, the lines of worry etched around his eyes, the faint scars marring his features. This was the beast, unburdened by the curse, but marked by the years he'd spent imprisoned within his monstrous form. A wave of relief washed over Bell, quickly followed by a tide of uncertainty. This man, handsome and human as he now appeared, was still a stranger to her. The man, seemingly mirroring her thoughts, spoke first. Bell, he rumbled, his voice deeper than she remembered, but unmistakably gentle. Is it truly you? Belle found herself nodding, unable to tear her gaze away from his face. Lumiere, his flame flickering excitedly, let out a joyous chirp. Master Maurice, you're finally free! The man, Maurice, turned towards the enchanted objects. A flicker of recognition crossed his face. Lumiere, Mrs. Potts, Chip. But how? Before he could finish his question, Cogsworth his gears whirring with renewed vigor, chimed in. The curse. Master Maurice, broken at last, thanks to Miss Bell's bravery and a healthy dose of forbidden magic. 
Maurice's gaze returned to Belle, filled with a mixture of gratitude and curiosity. You... You broke the curse? He said, his voice filled with awe. Belle took a step forward, a question burning on her tongue. Maurice, she began hesitantly. The portrait. She reached into her pocket and pulled out the small, worn frame. How is it connected to you? And why does it look like my father? Maurice's face paled. He reached for the portrait, his hands trembling slightly. A wave of sadness washed over his features. Belle, he said, his voice barely a whisper. You are my daughter. Belle's world tilted on its axis. Her father, the inventor, the kind man she thought she knew, was somehow linked to the beast. To this man standing before her, confusion battled with a flicker of dawning comprehension. Seeing the confusion on her face, Maurice sighed. There's much to explain, he said, his voice thick with emotion. About your mother, about the curse, and the night the beast took me from your village. He ushered Belle towards a plush armchair, collapsing onto the one opposite her. As the fire crackled in the hearth, casting warm shadows across the hall, Maurice began his story. He spoke of his forbidden love for a beautiful enchantress, a creation that turned malevolent. He spoke of the curse placed upon him by the enchantress in a fit of rage, a curse that would transform him into a beast unless he received love in return. He spoke of how he stumbled upon Belle's village, desperate for help, and how, in a moment of desperation, he had taken her father, hoping the love between a parent and child could break the curse. But the curse, fueled by the enchantress's hatred, only mutated. Maurice became a beast, trapped within a monstrous form, with no memory of his past life. Belle listened in stunned silence, the pieces of the puzzle finally falling into place. Her connection to the beast wasn't merely a coincidence. It was a cruel twist of fate. The very person she tried to save was her own father. Tears welled up in her eyes. She rushed forward and engulfed Maurice in a tight embrace. Father, she whispered, her voice thick with emotion. Oh, I am back. Maurice held her close, his own eyes brimming with tears. It's good to be home, Belle, he murmured. But a pulled back slightly, his face etched with concern. The curse. What about the enchantress? A shiver ran down Belle's spine. The curse might be broken, but the source of its darkness remained. And with a jolt of realization, she understood that their journey was far from over. They had to confront the enchantress to break the curse completely and ensure it wouldn't ensnare them again. Looking around at the faces of Lumiere, Mrs. Potts, Mrs. Chip, and Cogsworth, all of whom had been affected by the curse, Belle steeled her resolve. We'll deal with her, she declared, her voice firm, together. As the embers of the fire danced in the hearth, a new chapter unfolded before them. The castle, once a prison, now buzzed with a tentative hope. Belle and Maurice spent the next few days reconnecting, their conversations filled with a mixture of joy and sorrow. Belle learned about her mother, a brilliant inventor who had tragically passed away when she was young. Maurice shared stories of his life before the curse, his voice filled with longing for the life he had lost. However, the shadow of the Enchantress loomed large. Belle couldn't shake the feeling that their victory was incomplete. The staff, now devoid of its dark magic, felt strangely warm in her hand. A faint hum resonated within it, as if whispering stories of the past. One evening, Belle confided in Lumiere and Cogsworth. The staff, she said, her voice hushed. It feels different. There's a presence within it, something that wants to communicate. Lumiere, his flame flickering thoughtfully, mused. Perhaps it holds memories of the Enchantress, echoes of her pain and rage. Cogsworth word his gears in agreement. Perhaps, by understanding her story, we can understand the source of the curse and find a way to heal not just the land, but the Enchantress herself. Belle's eyes widened. Heal? The Enchantress? The idea was a radical one. All they knew of the Enchantress was her cruelty, her devastating curse. But was there more to her story? Could there be a way to break the cycle of hatred and find a path to redemption? It's a risk, Lumiere admitted, but perhaps one worth taking. 
The darkness within the staff can only be banished by light. A spark of determination ignited in Belle's eyes. Then that's what we shall do, she declared. We will delve into the staff's memories, learn the Enchantress's story, and find a way to bring light back into her heart. Their quest, however, wouldn't be easy. The staff's memories could be a labyrinth of emotions, filled with pain and despair, but with newfound hope and a shared purpose. Belle, Maurice, Lumiere, Cogsworth, and the others embarked on a new adventure, one that would take them into the very heart of the darkness. With the hope of finding redemption not just for the castle, but for the fallen enchantress as well. Weeks turned into months as the castle buzzed with an activity unseen in years. Maurice, reunited with Belle and free from the curse, reveled in his newfound humanity. He marveled at the enchanted objects, their personalities a stark contrast to the cold silence he'd endured as a beast. However, a shadow of unease lingered. The enchantress remained a looming threat, a reminder that the curse could return. Belle, determined to find a permanent solution, spent hours poring over the Book of Forgotten Spells. One rainy afternoon, while browsing the section on enchantresses, a particular passage caught her eye. It spoke of a hidden chamber within the castle, a place where the enchantress kept her most powerful artifacts. Legend said it held the key to undoing her magic, a mystical object called the Mirror of Truth. Intrigued, Belle shared her discovery with Maurice. His face, however, paled at the mention of the hidden chamber. That place, he muttered, his voice strained. It's best left undisturbed. But Belle, fueled by a desire to end the threat for good, was determined. After much persuasion, she managed to convince Maurice to reveal its location. It was a secret passage hidden behind a tapestry in the abandoned West Wing, the very area where the forbidden spellbook resided. With a mixture of apprehension and excitement, Belle and Maurice ventured into the passage. The air grew colder with each step, the only sound their echoing footsteps and the occasional drip of water. After a seemingly endless descent, they emerged into a vast, cavernous chamber dimly lit by flickering torches. The room was a treasure trove of magical artifacts. Gleaming crystals pulsed with an otherworldly light, vials filled with swirling liquids lined to the walls, and strange contraptions hummed with unseen energy. But Belle's eyes were drawn to a large, ornate mirror at the far end of the chamber. Its surface shimmered with an ethereal glow, seemingly beckoning her closer. As they approached, a voice, filled with a chilling power, echoed through the cavern. So, the beast and his kin have finally found their way to my sanctum. Belle spun around to find the enchantress standing in the shadows. Her once beautiful features were twisted with malice, her eyes glowing with a malevolent light. She held a staff crackling with dark energy, its power unsettlingly familiar. Terror threatened to engulf Belle, but the image of the beast, now Maurice, flashed in her mind. She straightened her spine, refusing to show fear. Enchantress, she declared, her voice stronger than she felt. We've come to end your reign. We have the mirror of truth, and it will reveal your lies and break your curse. The Enchantress let out a derisive laugh. Foolish child, the mirror of truth can be a double-edged sword. It reflects not just the truth, but also the darkest secrets of those who gaze upon it. A flicker of doubt crossed Belle's mind. But then, remembering the sacrifices made, the bond forged with Maurice and the enchanted objects, she knew she couldn't back down. With a resolute nod, Belle stepped forward, Maurice close behind her. They stood before the mirror of truth, its surface swirling with an ever-changing kaleidoscope of colors. The enchantress watched, a cruel smile playing on her lips. Taking a deep breath, Belle closed her eyes and gazed into the mirror. Belle felt a surge of energy course through her as she met her reflection in the mirror of truth. Unlike a regular mirror, the surface shimmered with a dreamlike quality, as if peeling back layers of time and revealing memories both cherished and buried. Instead of her usual reflection, Belle saw a younger version of herself, standing on the steps of their village cottage, waving goodbye to her father as he left for his latest invention demonstration. A wave of longing washed over her, a reminder of the life she once knew before the beast entered their world. But the images shifted, and darker scenes began to unfold. She saw the villagers' fear upon seeing the beast, 
their cruelty mirroring his own monstrous transformation. Shame and guilt flared within her, momentarily clouding her vision. Then, as if sensing her emotions, the mirror shifted again. This time, she saw Maurice, trapped in his beast form, roaring in frustration. But amidst the rage, a flicker of recognition flickered in his eyes, a father searching for his daughter. A sob escaped Belle's lips. These reflections weren't accusations. They were a tapestry woven with pain, fear, and the desperate yearning for connection. The curse had twisted them all, warping their emotions and fueling a cycle of negativity. As Belle wrestled with these revelations, a cold touch on her shoulder startled her. She turned to see the Enchantress standing beside her, a triumphant smirk etched on her face. The mirror of truth reveals all, doesn't it? The Enchantress taunted. It shows your own fear, your father's failings, and the truth behind the villagers' prejudice. Can you truly claim to be innocent in this web of misfortune? Belle's mind raced. The Enchantress was right. The events that led to the curse were a culmination of fear, anger, and misunderstanding. But surrendering to these emotions wouldn't solve anything. Stealing her resolve, Belle lifted her chin and met the Enchantress's gaze. Yes, she declared, her voice ringing with newfound clarity. The past is filled with mistakes, but it doesn't have to define our future. We can choose to learn from it, to break the cycle of negativity. The Enchantress scoffed. Foolish child! Sentimentality won't save you. Now, face your own truth. The mirror's image flickered, and a new scene unfolded. It was Belle in the Beast's library, their shared laughter echoing in the room. She saw the flicker of humanity in the Beast's eyes, the vulnerability beneath the fear. The scene shifted again, showing Maurice, transformed yet human in his heart, holding the portrait of Belle and pleading for her help. A warmth bloomed in Belle's chest. Despite the pain and betrayal, there were moments of kindness, of understanding. These were the embers of hope that needed fanning, not the flames of anger. Turning back to the Enchantress, Belle held her gaze unwavering. Yes, she admitted, the past was filled with darkness, but it also held kindness, empathy, and the desire for connection. And that, I believe, is the key to breaking your curse. The Enchantress's smirk faltered for a moment. She didn't expect such defiance, such a firm belief in the power of connection. Seeing her uncertainty, Belle pressed on. We all made mistakes, she continued, her voice reaching a fever pitch. But we can choose to rise above them. We can choose forgiveness and understanding. That is the true power of the mirror of truth, not to reveal darkness, but to show us the capacity for light that resides within us all. As Belle spoke, the cavern seemed to vibrate with energy. The Enchantress stumbled back, her staff clattering to the stone floor. The mirror of truth, reflecting Belle's unwavering belief, pulsed with a blinding light that engulfed the chamber. When the light subsided, the cavern was cloaked in an eerie silence. The Enchantress was gone, leaving behind only her staff and a faint echo of malice that lingered in the air. A gasp escaped Belle as she turned to Maurice. He was staring at her, a mixture of awe and relief on his face. You... you truly believe that? He asked, his voice hoarse. I know it, Belle replied, a smile spreading across her face. The darkness won't disappear overnight, but together we can build a future where kindness and understanding prevail. Their victory, however, was not complete. The Enchantress might be gone, but the threat remained. The staff, crackling with dark energy, lay as a constant reminder of the battle yet to be fought. Picking up the staff cautiously, Belle turned to Maurice. We may have broken the curse, she said, her voice filled with determination. But the source of the curse resides within this staff. We need to find a way to heal its darkness, to truly vanquish the Enchantress's malice. Maurice nodded grimly, the weight of responsibility settling on his shoulders. Perhaps the Book of Forgotten Spells holds the answer he suggested, his voice laced with a newfound hope. Perhaps, Belle agreed, her gaze fixed on the staff's intricate carvings. But the spells might require more than just ingredients. They might require a sacrifice, a willingness to delve into the heart of the darkness and confront the Enchantress's pain. A tense silence descended upon the cavern. The staff pulsed once, 
a flicker of malevolent energy dancing within its core. This was not a simple task. It demanded courage, empathy, and a willingness to face the darkest corners of the Enchantress's soul. Taking a deep breath, Belle looked at Maurice, her eyes shining with a fierce determination. Are you ready to face the past, father? To understand the root of the curse and finally set everything right? Maurice met her gaze, a newfound strength reflected in his own eyes. Together, he declared, his voice firm. We can face anything, Belle. As long as we have each other, there's nothing we can't overcome. With a newfound purpose fueling their steps, Belle and Maurice left the cavern, the staff humming ominously in their wake. Their journey wasn't over, but with a shared determination to heal the darkness, they embarked on a new quest, one that would lead them into the depths of the Enchantress's history, forcing them to confront not just a villain, but the pain that fueled her curse. The victory in the Enchantress's sanctum hung heavy in the air. The staff, pulsating with a malevolent energy, served as a stark reminder of the lingering threat. Belle hefted it in her hand, its weight a burden, yet a promise. We may have broken the curse, Belle declared, her voice echoing in the cavernous chamber. But the darkness has nowhere to go, if not dealt with. Maurice, his face reflecting a mixture of relief and unease, nodded solemnly. You're right, Belle. We must find a way to purify the staff, to sever the Enchantress's last hold on this land. The thought of venturing out into the unknown, searching for a way to purify the staff, filled Belle with a nervous excitement. The castle, once a prison, now felt like a home, filled with the warm camaraderie of Lumiere, Mrs. Potts, Chip, and Cogsworth. But she knew the peace was fragile, dependent on their ability to vanquish the last vestiges of the Enchantress's magic. Days turned into weeks as they scoured the castle library, searching for any clues about purifying magical artifacts. Belle spent hours poring over ancient texts, their pages filled with cryptic symbols and forgotten lore. Finally, a glimmer of hope emerged. Deep within a dusty tome on magical creatures, Belle stumbled upon a passage describing a mythical creature called the Phoenix. According to the text, the Phoenix's tears held immense restorative power, capable of cleansing objects tainted by darkness. However, the quest wouldn't be easy. Phoenixes were said to reside in a distant land shrouded in perpetual twilight, a place known as the Evergloom. Reaching it would be perilous, a journey fraught with unknown dangers. A wave of uncertainty washed over Belle. Leaving the castle, the place that had become a refuge, filled her with apprehension. But the thought of the staff, a ticking time bomb, spurred her onward. Gathering her courage, Belle shared her discovery with Maurice and the enchanted objects. A tense silence filled the room. Lumiere, his flame flickering anxiously, expressed his concerns about the dangers of the Evergloom. Cogsworth, though his gears whirred with a sense of duty, voiced the fear of being separated from Belle for such a long time. Maurice, however, surprised them all. He stepped forward and grasped Belle's shoulder. I will accompany you, Belle, he declared, his voice firm. Together, we can face anything. Belle's heart swelled with gratitude. Having her father by her side filled her with newfound strength. Looking around at the concerned faces in the room, she knew their bond, forged in the crucible of the beast's curse, wouldn't be easily broken. With a heavy heart but unwavering resolve, Belle and Maurice began their preparations for the journey. Cogsworth, ever the resourceful one, drafted detailed maps based on the vague descriptions in the ancient text. Lumiere, determined to help despite their impending separation, offered them a magical lantern that would provide light in the perpetual twilight of the Evergloom. Mrs. Potts, her spout trembling with emotion, baked them a hearty provision of enchanted pastries that would sustain them on their quest. Even Chip, the little teacup, chipped in, insisting they take his favorite blanket for comfort. As the final preparations were made, a bittersweet farewell took place. Belle hugged each of the enchanted objects, promising to return soon. The weight of their love and concern was a powerful talisman against the darkness they were about to face. Finally, with the Evergloom map clutched in her hand, the magical lantern illuminating their path, and the staff secured at her back, Belle and Maurice stepped out of the castle gates. The world they stepped into was bathed in the golden glow of the setting sun, a stark contrast to the perpetual twilight that awaited them. 
Taking a deep breath, Belle turned to Maurice. Are you ready, Father? She asked, a flicker of nervousness in her voice. Maurice smiled gently, his eyes shining with pride. Ready as I'll ever be, Belle? Together, we can find the Phoenix and bring light back to this land. With their hearts filled with hope and a shared determination, Belle and Maurice ventured into the unknown, their quest for the Phoenix marking the beginning of a new chapter in their journey. The Evergloom loomed before them, a challenge to be overcome, but also a symbol of the hope that flickered within them. The forest bordering the castle grounds was familiar to Belle, even comforting in its normalcy. But as they ventured deeper, following the map's cryptic directions, the air grew heavier, the sunlight filtering through the leaves a dull, sickly green. The bird song that had filled the air vanished, replaced by an unsettling silence broken only by the rustle of unseen creatures in the undergrowth. Maurice walked beside Belle, his hand resting reassuringly on her shoulder. He seemed older, his face etched with worry lines that hadn't been there before. The weight of their shared history, the curse and its aftermath, pressed heavily on him. Are you all right, Father? Belle asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Maurice squeezed her shoulder. Just remembering what this land used to be like, a place teeming with life, not shrouded in such bleakness. He wasn't wrong. The forest, once vibrant, was now sickly. Withered vines choked the trees, and strange fungi glowed with an eerie luminescence in the fading light. As they progressed, the map's warnings became startlingly apparent. Razor-sharp thorns tore at their clothes, and strange, glowing mists caused hallucinations that taunted them with their deepest fears. Belle clung to the lantern for light, its magical glow a beacon against the encroaching darkness. They pressed onward, fueled by a mixture of determination and a growing sense of urgency. The staff, secured at Belle's back, felt heavier with every passing step, a constant reminder of the darkness they couldn't outrun. One particularly harrowing night, as they huddled together for warmth under Chip's borrowed blanket, Maurice spoke. Do you think the Phoenix is real, Belle? His voice trembled slightly, his eyes reflecting the flickering flames of the lantern. I have to believe it is, Belle replied, her voice firm despite a tremor of self-doubt. There has to be a way to end this darkness, to heal this land. The next day unfolded in a blur of exhaustion and mounting fear. As they crested a particularly steep hill, the landscape before them changed abruptly. The dense forest gave way to a vast, desolate plain shrouded in perpetual twilight. The air hung heavy with an oppressive stillness. This was the Evergloom, a place where the sun never truly shone. Belle felt a wave of despair wash over her. Could they truly find a mythical creature in this desolate wasteland? Suddenly, a colossal shadow stretched across the plain. Belle and Maurice looked up to see a creature unlike anything they'd ever seen, a gigantic bird with plumage that shimmered like molten gold, the phoenix. But something was wrong. The majestic bird, instead of radiating life and warmth, seemed tethered to the ground, its wings drooping, its golden eyes dulled with despair. It's hurt, Belle whispered, a wave of empathy washing over her. The realization struck them both like a bolt of lightning. The Evergloom wasn't just a physical manifestation of darkness, it was a reflection of the despair that lingered within the land after the curse. And the phoenix, once a symbol of rebirth and hope, was trapped, its power to heal diminished. A new resolve bloomed in Belle's chest. Their quest wasn't just about finding the phoenix's tears, it was about healing the land itself. The sight of the injured phoenix, its majestic form shrouded in despair, filled Belle and Maurice with a mix of awe and concern. The desolation of the Evergloom wasn't just a physical landscape, it mirrored the lingering darkness that poisoned the land. And the key to their success, they realized, wasn't simply capturing a mythical bird's tears, but healing the source of its suffering. Maurice, ever the inventor, knelt on the ground, examining the area around the phoenix. There must be a reason it's tethered here, he muttered, his brow furrowed in concentration. Bell. Her gaze, drawn to the ashen landscape, noticed a strange phenomenon. Withered patches of land appeared to radiate a faint, dark mist. As she moved closer, a feeling of dread washed over her. This was the source of the Evergloom, the remnants of the Enchantress's curse, 
clinging like a disease. Putting two and two together, a realization dawned on her. The phoenix, a creature of rebirth and renewal, must be weakened by the darkness pervading the land. It wouldn't be able to heal the Evergloom while trapped in its own despair. We can't take its tears if it's too weak, she said, her voice filled with urgency. We need to find a way to heal the land first. Maurice nodded, understanding glimmering in his eyes. And perhaps, by doing so, we might also help the phoenix regain its strength. Their focus shifted from capturing the mythical creature to healing the land. Maurice, with his inventor's mind, started tinkering with leftover supplies from the castle. He rigged Lumiere's magical lantern to project a beam of pure light, a concentrated form of the castle's warmth and magic. Belle, drawing on her childhood memories and the stories her mother used to tell, began to sing. Songs of hope, resilience, and the cycle of life filled the desolate plain. Her voice, initially shaky, grew stronger with each verse, echoing through the gloom like a beacon in the darkness. Slowly, almost imperceptibly at first, a change began to occur. Patches of land bathed in the concentrated light from the lantern started to show signs of life. Tiny green shoots pushed through the cracked earth, reaching for the light. The dark mist receded, leaving behind a faint shimmer of renewed vitality. The phoenix, sensing the shift in energy, stirred. Its golden eyes, once filled with despair, flickered with a renewed spark. As the song continued, Growing in intensity, the creature lifted its head, its wings unfolding with a majestic rustle. With a final flourish, Belle finished her song. The Evergloom wasn't completely vanquished, but a hopeful glow now permeated the land, a testament to their efforts. But before they could celebrate, a choice presented itself. The phoenix, its strength returning, unleashed a single teardrop, shimmering with an otherworldly light. It landed at Belle's feet, a silent offering. However, as Belle reached out, she noticed the phoenix falter again. The energy it had expended to heal the land and produce a single tear had left it drained. Stealing another tear now might weaken the creature permanently. A wave of uncertainty washed over Belle. The staff, the key to ending the threat of the Enchantress, still pulsed with darkness. But a part of her recoiled at the thought of exploiting the very creature they sought to heal. Looking at Maurice, his eyes reflecting the same internal conflict, Belle knew they had a decision to make. They could take the tear, fulfill their immediate goal, but risk jeopardizing the phoenix's well-being and potentially prolonging the struggle to heal the land. Or they could choose a different path, one that prioritized the phoenix's recovery and trusted in their ability to find another way. The choice, heavy with its potential consequences, hung in the stagnant air of the Evergloom. The shimmering tear of the phoenix lay at Belle's feet, a beacon of hope tinged with a heavy dilemma. Taking it meant a potential cure for the darkness lingering within the staff, a faster route to ridding their land of the Enchantress's lingering influence. But it also meant draining the already weakened creature, potentially delaying the complete healing of the Evergloom. Bell glanced at Maurice, his face etched with a similar struggle. His eyes, a mirror of her own uncertainty, held a flicker of understanding. They both knew the staff was vital, Yet harming the phoenix felt wrong, like exploiting the very creature they needed to heal the land. Breaking the silence, Maurice spoke, his voice hoarse. There has to be another way, Belle, a way to purify the staff without harming this magnificent creature. Belle nodded, a surge of determination replacing her doubt. We can't risk setting back the progress we've made. The land needs the phoenix as much as we need a solution for the staff. With a heavy heart, Belle knelt before the phoenix, reaching out a hand, she not to touch it, but to project a soothing aura. The warmth from the castle's magic, channeled through her touch, resonated with the creature. The phoenix, its eyes reflecting a flicker of gratitude, dipped its head in a gesture of understanding. Suddenly, a gust of wind swept across the Evergloom, carrying with it a faint, melodic chiming. The sound grew louder, and as they looked up, a sight filled them with awe. Emerging from the twilight sky was a flock of creatures, smaller than the phoenix but similar in form, their feathers shimmering with an iridescent glow. They circled overhead, their harmonious chiming filling the air with a wave of soothing energy. What are they? Maurice whispered, his voice filled with wonder. Belle, 
a smile spreading across her face, remembered the stories her mother used to tell. Tales of lesser phoenixes, harbingers of renewal, who traveled with the larger phoenix on journeys of healing. As if on cue, one of the smaller phoenixes swooped down, its wings brushing the staff strapped to Belle's back. A wave of radiant light pulsed from the creature, washing over the staff. Belle could feel the darkness within it withering, replaced by a faint hum of restored magic. The other phoenixes followed suit, their combined energy bathing the staff in an ethereal glow. When they finally retreated, the staff no longer pulsed with malevolent energy. It felt neutral, its true nature restored. Relief washed over Belle and Maurice. Their leap of faith, their decision to prioritize the phoenix's well-being, had not gone unrewarded. The evergloom shimmered with newfound hope, patches of green spreading further across the once desolate landscape. The phoenix, its strength restored by the arrival of its kin, spread its majestic wings. It let out a powerful cry, a sound of triumph and a promise of renewal. As they watched the flock of phoenixes disappear into the twilight sky, Belle knew their journey was far from over. The Evergloom still held scars, and the threat of the Enchantress might resurface. But for now, they basked in the fragile hope that bloomed amidst the desolate plains. With a renewed sense of purpose, Belle and Maurice turned their backs on the Evergloom, the now purified staff strapped safely on Belle's back. They had a long journey back to the castle, but they also carried something far more valuable. The knowledge that, even in the darkest of places, a single act of kindness could spark a fire of hope, and sometimes. All it took was a leap of faith to find the help you needed in the most unexpected places. The journey back to the castle was filled with a quiet camaraderie. Belle and Maurice walked side by side, sharing stories and laughter. The weight of their shared history, once a burden, now felt like a foundation of understanding. The Evergloom, though not completely healed, pulsed with a renewed glow. Patches of green dotted the once desolate landscape, a testament to their efforts. As they crossed the border back into the familiar forest, a wave of relief washed over them. Reaching the castle gates, they were greeted by a joyous uproar. Lumiere, his flame burning brighter than ever, practically levitated with excitement. Mrs. Potts, overflowing with relief, fussed over them, insisting they have a hot meal and a long rest. Chip, perched on Cogsworth's shoulder, chimed in with a flurry of excited questions about their adventure. The castle, once a place of confinement, now felt like a haven, filled with the warmth of genuine affection. Over a hearty dinner prepared by Mrs. Potts, Belle and Maurice recounted their harrowing journey to the Evergloom. They spoke of the majestic phoenix and its selfless act of healing the land, and the unexpected arrival of the smaller phoenixes. Their tales were met with gasps of wonder and murmurs of awe. As the fire crackled merrily in the hearth, a comfortable silence settled over the room. Belle, still basking in the warmth of their reunion, felt a flicker of unease. The staff, now devoid of darkness, lay dormant. But a question gnawed at her. What secrets did it hold? Father, she began hesitantly, her eyes fixed on the staff propped against the wall. Do you think the staff might have something to tell us? Perhaps a clue about the Enchantress or how to prevent her return? Maurice, his brow furrowed in thought, stroked his chin. It's possible, he said slowly. But how do we unlock its secrets? Lumiere, his voice filled with an air of intrigue, chimed in. Perhaps it requires a specific trigger. A certain word, a touch of magic. The following days were devoted to experimentation. They scoured the castle library for ancient texts on staff magic, hoping to find a spell or phrase to unlock its secrets. Belle spent hours tracing the intricate engravings on the staff's surface, hoping to decipher a hidden message. Their efforts, however, yielded little progress. The staff remained stubbornly silent, its secrets refusing to be revealed. A sense of frustration began to settle in. One evening, as Belle sat by the window, the setting sun casting long shadows across the room, a thought struck her. Perhaps the staff wasn't meant to be unlocked with spells or magic. Perhaps it simply needed someone to listen. Picking up the staff, she closed her eyes and held it close. Instead of focusing on extracting information, she focused on feeling. She imagined the staff as a sentient being with a story to tell. As she concentrated, a faint whispering filled her ears. 
It wasn't a voice, but a sensation, a feeling woven from memories and emotions. Images flashed before her mind's eye. A young woman with eyes filled with sorrow, a garden vibrant with life, and a chilling, cackling laugh. The images were fleeting, but they were enough. In that moment, Belle understood. The staff belonged to the Enchantress before the curse, and the echoes she felt were fragments of the Enchantress's past. A hint of a deeper story. A shiver ran down her spine. The staff held the key not just to defeating the Enchantress, but to understanding her. Perhaps, by unraveling her past, they could find a way to redeem her, or at least prevent her darkness from consuming her once more. A new determination filled Belle. The staff, instead of being a weapon, might be a bridge, a chance to understand their enemy and perhaps find a path toward lasting peace. Sharing her newfound understanding with Maurice and the enchanted objects, Belle proposed a new course of action. Their quest wouldn't just be about vanquishing an enemy, but about understanding the root of their conflict. The castle echoed with murmurs of agreement. They would delve deeper into the staff's secrets, hoping to not only uncover the Enchantress's past, but also find a way to prevent the darkness from rising again. As they stood united, a renewed sense of purpose filled the air. Their journey, far from over, promised to be fraught with new challenges and unexpected discoveries. They had tasted freedom from the curse, and now they yearned not just for peace, but for true understanding. The staff, a symbol of darkness, now held the potential for a brighter future, a future where empathy and understanding could prevail. The revelation about the staff's potential as a bridge rather than a weapon sparked a fervent energy within the castle walls. Bell, fueled by a newfound sense of purpose, felt a responsibility to delve deeper into the Enchantress's story. Days were spent poring over dusty tomes in the library, searching for anything related to the staff's origins or the Enchantress herself. Cogsworth, ever the meticulous one, meticulously cataloged their findings, while Lumiere's flickering flame provided tireless illumination for their late-night sessions. One evening, amidst a pile of ancient scrolls, Bell stumbled upon a faded portrait. The woman depicted had a striking resemblance to the fleeting image she experienced through the staff. Flowing dark hair, piercing green eyes, and a hint of sadness around the mouth. The inscription below the portrait read, Ilara, Guardian of the Whisperwood. A surge of excitement ran through Bell. This was a name, a lead, a tangible piece of the Enchantress's past. Further research revealed that Alara wasn't a malicious sorceress, but a protector of a magical forest known as the Whisperwood, said to hold immense power and a delicate ecological balance. It was rumored that the staff was once an instrument used to maintain this balance. But then, the texts grew cryptic. There were mentions of a betrayal, a broken trust, and a darkness that slowly consumed Alara, twisting her magic and turning her into the vengeful figure they knew as the Enchantress. The portrait, though beautiful, held a hint of something else, a deep-seated pain, a hurt that festered for years. A piece of the puzzle fell into place. The curse, the darkness, it wasn't born out of malice, but out of a profound sense of betrayal. Sharing these discoveries with Maurice and the enchanted objects ignited a wave of discussion. Perhaps, Cogsworth rumbled, his gears whirring thoughtfully. The staff can be used to heal the Whisperwood, restore the balance Alara once protected. Maybe by healing the source of her pain, we can heal the darkness within the staff itself. The idea resonated with Belle. Their focus shifted from unraveling the specifics of the betrayal to understanding the hurt that fueled the Enchantress's rage. The staff, they realized, wasn't just holding memories, it was holding emotions, a record of Alara's descent into darkness. Maurice, his brow furrowed in concentration, spoke. But how do we access these emotions? How do we navigate this labyrinth of pain without getting lost in it ourselves? The question hung heavy in the air. The staff, a potential pathway to understanding, also held the risk of overwhelming them with negativity. A solution was needed, a way to navigate the staff's emotional landscape safely. Suddenly, Lumiere, his flame flickering with newfound inspiration, spoke. Perhaps, a connection is needed. Someone with a pure heart, someone untainted by the darkness of the curse. All eyes turned to Belle, 
She was the one who had first made a connection with the staff, who had heard its whispers, and importantly, she hadn't experienced the curse firsthand, her heart untainted by its bitterness. A shiver ran down Belle's spine. The path ahead was fraught with uncertainty, but as she looked at the hopeful faces around her, she knew she couldn't refuse. With a deep breath, Belle stepped forward, her resolve unwavering. Then I will be the one to delve deeper, she declared, her voice ringing with determination. Together, we will heal the Whisperwood, and perhaps, in doing so, heal the darkness within the staff and the Enchantress herself. As Belle held the staff close, its surface buzzing with a faint tremor, a new chapter in their journey unfolded. They were no longer just fighting a curse, but venturing into the heart of a broken spirit, hoping to find redemption amidst the shadows of the past. The road ahead was shrouded in unknowns, but with hearts filled with empathy and a flicker of hope, they were ready to face the echoes of the past and rewrite the story's ending. What an incredible journey we've been on with Belle and Maurice. They faced the desolate Evergloom, befriended a majestic phoenix, and even uncovered the sad truth behind the Enchantress's darkness. This captivating story reminds us that even the darkest hearts can have a glimmer of hope. We all have the power to choose understanding and forgiveness. Thank you for sharing this adventure, dear listeners. Until next time, may your days be filled with wonder and your nights with sweet dreams.